Um, thank you, Michael. So today we have planned two presentations from researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital and then a discussion with leading experts in the field, uh, Dr. Peter Byers, Dr. Hal Dietz, and Dr. Diana Milowitz. So today we hope to provide you with a basic understanding of how gene editing works, review some research that's currently being utilized for an ACTA2 mutation, and then we're gonna have a discussion with the speakers and the panelists to learn more about the possibilities and limitations of CRISPR. So with over a thousand people registered today, um, it will be hard to get all of your questions answered. My, most of the most frequently asked questions that we get are, you know, what is the promise of, of CRISPR? Um, is it a reality for us? What would be the timeline? And maybe what are the roadblocks to getting that technology to these conditions? So we hope most of the questions will be answered by the presentations and discussions that we're going to have. If you have additional questions, please post them in the Q&A section. Um, and we'll try to get some of those answered either using short videos or articles in the weeks to come. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Klein Stever. He is currently an assistant investigator at Massachusetts General uh, Hospital. He's also an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a Caden Lamb Lambert MGH research scholar. Some of the goals in his lab are to engineer and improve genome editing technologies to optimize methods to accelerate the development of CRISPR enzymes and to transform these safer, more effective and versatile tools into new classes of genetic therapies. So Dr. Kleinstiver. All right, thank you so much. I saw lots of folks from Ontario, Canada, which is where I'm originally from. So I feel at home on this webinar. Um, hopefully everyone can see the slides here, all right? Um, so I've been asked to keep this to 15 minutes. Normally, I would give this lecture for like two hours, so I will do my best to give a general introduction to CRISPR and genome editing tools. Um, just quickly, some disclosures. Um, I won't talk much about our work today, uh, but we do file patents. I am an advisor to various companies and consult for um, biotech companies seeking to commercialize gene editing technologies. Um, Again, although I won't show much uh, work from my group, I'm just showing a quick picture of the folks in my lab doing some really exciting work. Um, happy to chat more about it in the Q&A or in other discussions later. But I'm just, again, very grateful to work with a, a motivated and talented group of trainees. So uh, maybe five minutes each, I'll tell you about genome editing technologies at a really high level. I'll talk about how we think about um, developing these tools and what make them, uh, what uh, properties make them practically useful as therapeutics, and then I'll talk really briefly about applications. And again, I could spend an hour on each of these individual sections uh, if we had time. So uh, at a really high level, we can think of the genome as 3 billion bases of letters. And if we zoom in on any specific spot in our genomes and our cells, um, we can look at these individual DNA sequences and begin to recognize important features. And shown here in yellow is a, a specific gene we have our start codon here, the M letter, and then we get a translated amino acid turning into a protein after that. And this is what our genome largely does. It makes proteins uh, to allow our cells to uh, behave as cells and organisms. Um, really problematically, amongst these 3 billion bases, if we have single letter changes or mutations, um, this can cause disease. And what this uh, leads to, often when we have these single letter changes, are these amino acid changes that change the function of the underlying protein. So actually what we're looking at here is a really famous genetic mutation that causes sickle cell disease, where it's a single letter change from an A to a T that causes this seemingly benign amino acid change, but this changes functionally uh, red blood cells that cause them to sickle and causes sickle cell disease. So where genome editing technologies are practically really useful, is to be able to model these mutations so we can study the impact of these mutations uh, and how they cause disease. But also, I think more obviously, how we can take these uh, mutant sequences and turn them back into the original wild type or normal sequence um, that lacks disease. 
And this is the promise of genome editing, to be able to make these precise genetic changes to the genome. Um, here's just a quick pie chart. I promise I, I'm going to show like two data slides in this whole presentation. Um, just trying to give you a sense of the types of uh, DNA mutations that cause disease. And the point here is just to emphasize that there are a lot of different types of mutations that cause disease. It's not just single letter changes. So from a genome editing standpoint, what this means is we need a lot of tools or technologies to be able to go and think about correcting different genetic mutations. So gene therapy, which you may know about, uh, largely is the process of delivering corrective genes into a patient. So if you have a faulty or mutated gene, gene therapy largely seeks to replace that broken copy of a gene. Whereas with gene editing, what we can do is go in and zoom in on individual bases and make specific corrections to the native locus in the chromosome to restore the physiological expression of that gene. And importantly, gene editing is durable because we can make changes to our chromosomes that last through cell divisions and through the lifetime of an organism. So where did CRISPR come from? Well, CRISPR is a pretty amazing bacterial immune system, and it's been studied for several decades now, um, basically learning how these CRISPR-Cas enzymes enable bacteria to defend themselves against invading DNA. Um, what this looks like at a really high level is that these CRISPR-Cas enzymes basically mediate the interaction with foreign DNA in a cell, and they can store some of this information in their bacterial chromosome and then use that to go and defend it, the bacteria against subsequent infections. So much like humans have an adaptive immune system, bacteria do as well, and that is CRISPR. CRISPR is their adaptive immune system. For genome editing, what we do is we harness some of the enzymes in this process that allow us to basically reprogram these enzymes to edit DNA. So while all this fundamental discovery was happening in CRISPR biology, the genome editing field also existed for many decades before that as well. And we had previous technologies before CRISPR that allowed us to make changes to the genome. Uh, but really there's this amazing convergence between the development of gene editing technologies and CRISPR biology that happened in 2012 and 2013 that led to this explosion in new tools that allow us to edit the genome with really high precision. So what this looks like is we have this one CRISPR protein that we call Cas9. Um, it's a large protein and it's directed to genomic sites or regions of the genome using an RNA molecule called a guide RNA. And what's been really transformational with CRISPR editing is that we can take part of this guide RNA and reprogram it to basically any sequence that we want and that tells Cas9 where to go in the genome. So we have this amazing GPS system. Uh, what researchers have done is basically decorate Cas9 with all kinds of enzymatic domains that allow us to now make different types of edits to the genome. We can knock out genes, we can correct genes, we can replace or insert or regulate genes depending on what we fuse to Cas9. Again, all dependent on the ability to target this Cas9 or CRISPR enzyme to really specific regions of the genome. So that's the 30,000 foot view of genome editing with CRISPR. These are bacterial uh, immune proteins that we can then reprogram to use in human genome editing. So now I'll pivot quickly and just talk really briefly about some of the properties of these tools that we should care about and some of the tools uh, in general. So again, these CRISPR proteins come from bacteria. So they have all these properties that they've evolved over time that allow the Cas enzyme to uh, um, cleave invading DNA, but they've also evolved properties that allow them to engage as an immune system. Um, when it comes to genome editing, a lot of these properties are problematic. Um, they restrict where in the genome we can target. Uh, they make genome editors less safe in the sense that they're naturally poised to find and edit off-target sites. So there's this really interesting contrast between how these enzymes evolved in nature and how we then now use them as genome editing tools. Um, and this is where my lab and many others have uh, really sought to use genome editing uh, or use protein engineering methods to evolve our genome editing tools to make them really flexible to edit most of the genome, to make them active so that we can edit a higher fraction of cells to make them safe so that we can edit only a single spot in the genome and not have unwanted off-target edits at other parts of the genome, and to allow us to make really precise types of edits. Uh, again, on that first slide, I showed you there's this really big diversity of genetic, uh, different types of genetic mutations, so we need tools that allow us to do that. 
So just really quickly, I'll describe a few of the technologies that we now have at our disposal to make genome edits. And I'll show you one example later where we have these technologies called base editors that allow us to make single base changes to the genome so we can edit uh, individual letters at a time using these tools. We have these other next generation tools called prime editors or click editors that now allow us to write specific sequences into the genome. So you could imagine if you have a, a deletion in your genome uh, that you want to correct, you would need a tool like a prime editor because you can restore the missing sequence. Um, there are other classes of tools that allow us to insert large sequences on the, the sort of the gene size scale and tools called epigenetic editors that allow us to activate or silence genes. And again, I could spend hours talking about any individual technology here, but hopefully this gives you a sense of the really incredible things that we can do with genome editing tools now to make different types of edits to the genome. So in the last part, I'll just briefly tell you about some of the exciting applications. And there are, you know, dream up anything you'd want to do to an organism, and you can now use genome editing tools to, to do that now. So I think some of the more obvious applications are in, you know, basic research, how we modify the genomes of cells to understand biology in model organisms so we can understand development or model uh, human diseases in functional genomics, again, for basic research purposes, but in then totally uh, different uh, scientific fields like in agriculture to impart desirable traits into crops. Um, genome editing has really begun to usher in sort of a new era in how we think about agriculture and food sustainability. But I think most relevant to this webinar is in therapeutics. So how do we think about using genome editing to treat genetic disease? And there are two main modalities of how one would do this. Um, for certain diseases where we have the fortune of removing tissues from a patient, we can envision treating those diseases ex vivo, where we can take hematopoietic stem cells out of a patient edit them in a, a dish or in a lab, expand them and reinfuse them into a patient. This is again useful for diseases like sickle cell disease or other blood disorders or uh, diseases like cancer where we can remove a patient's T cells, uh, edit them to enable them to target tumor cells, expand them and then reinfuse them into a patient. For most human genetic diseases though, we don't have the fortune of taking the tissue out of the patient. So we have to use delivery vehicles like viruses or lipid nanoparticles to deliver the genome editing enzymes into the patient for in vivo editing. Um, so as many of you may have heard, uh, the tail end of last year, the FDA approved the very first uh, genome editing therapeutic. Um, this is from a company, CRISPR Therapeutics, where they're uh, taking an approach to treat sickle cell disease. And at a really high up level, how this works is that um, you can basically remove blood stem cells from patients uh, affected by sickle cell disease. You can edit them in a dish to turn off this regulator of fetal hemoglobin. Um, by doing that, you basically overexpress fetal hemoglobin in, in the patient cells, uh, which compensates for um, the sickle globin that uh, is caused by their um, genetic mutation. Um, and then you can basically expand these cells, reinfuse them into the patient. Um, they ship home to the bone marrow and basically reconstitute their hematopoietic system leading to a durable cure for sickle cell disease. And uh, many folks have now been treated with this therapy and so far the, the safety and efficacy looks durable uh, and quite safe. So I think it's still very early days for gene editing therapeutics, but this is just one of many examples now um, where gene editing is playing a big role in the clinic. So in the last, I think I got two more minutes. I'll just quickly tell you about one uh, editing project that I've been working on with Mark at MGH and many others like uh, Patty Mussolino. Um, and here we're seeking to treat a genetic disease using a technology called base editors. And these again are the tools that are um, comprised of a CRISPR enzyme that we can target to a specific region of the genome. But to that enzyme, we fuse in another enzyme called a deaminase domain that allow us to make single letter changes to the genome. Without getting too much into the weeds here, um, a base editor can only uh, allow us to edit within a short five or six nucleotide window. So what that means is, we can only edit really specific regions of the genome using base editors, and the target base has to fall within that narrow edit window. Um, so when we want to treat a disease, we have to have tools to allow us to position the base editor over top of a mutation to go and correct it. So here this example is a single letter uh, mutation in the ACTA2 gene that causes this arginine to histidine amino acid change at a specific spot uh, in the gene. 
So what we need is an enzyme that basically would allow us to convert this A back to the native G base there to turn this protein back into the normal or wild type protein. So to do this, we can design a, a CRISPR-Cas target site for a base editor that allows us to position the edit window of the base editor over top of this mutated base. And when we do an experiment in cells, we observe really high levels of correction. But unfortunately, with this specific enzyme, we also observe editing of this nearby base um, that also would cause disease. So we needed a different strategy here where we built another enzyme that basically shifted the edit phase of this base editor so that it would still edit this target base, but now avoid editing this other nearby base. And that's exactly what we found here, where we basically achieved similar levels of editing or a correction of the mutation, but now with really only very low levels of unwanted editing at this neighboring DNA base. So the high level conclusion here is with the enzymes that we've built, we can directly reverse the genetic cause of this disease. And by using different tricks and different engineered enzymes in the lab, we can avoid unwanted edits that themselves would cause disease. So I think Mark's gonna cover most of this, but we can basically take the, the enzymes, we can put it in a viral vector and we can deliver it in, in vivo into a mouse model of this disease. In mice that are untreated, we find very rapid uh, progression of disease and death by you know six to eight weeks in most mice. But when we deliver the base editor and a viral vector into the uh, mouse model, what we find is this really dramatic extension in lifespan of these mice. And many of these mice are dying for, for, from preventable causes like bowel obstruction that would, for a human patient, uh, largely be treatable. So Mark, I, I believe we'll talk a lot more about this, but this is just to say that, you know, for this specific indication and mutation, we've developed a gene editing tool that in a mouse model looks like a promising approach to alleviate the symptoms of this disease. So hopefully I'm largely on time here, but just to summarize uh, the types of work that we do in my lab, which I've told you virtually nothing about, um, we build genome editing technologies. I'm a biochemist, so I'm really interested in using engineering approaches to tune these molecules to make them uh, more amenable as human therapeutics, to make them safe and effective. And of course, we're really interested in turning these enzymes into genetic therapies for a range of different diseases. So um, with that, I'll just quickly show a little cartoon of my lab and acknowledge all the funding sources that have supported our work over the years and happy to answer any questions um, in the, the Q&A session afterwards. I can figure out how to stop sharing. There we go. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Lindsay. Um, he is the director of the cardiovascular genetics program in the division of cardiology at MGH. Uh, he performs genetic evaluations and provides ongoing care for children and adults with genetically triggered vascular disease. He is a member of our uh, professional advisory board, and his research focuses on clinical expression of molecular etiology of human arterial disease. And he uses both human and murine uh, genetics, as well as animal modeling to investigate the pathological progression of inherited and sporadic arterial diseases. So, Mark? Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, let me see if I can get my sharing to work. Does that look uh, appropriate? We no, can we don't. See them. Can you guys see the? We no. don't see the slides. Ah, okay. Give me another second here. Okay, we see them now. Better. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So yeah, thank you, um, and um, thanks to the foundation. And and it was a great introduction by Ben. Um, I I learn every time he talks about enzymes. I learn a ton. Um, I wanted to to talk um, both about um, some work we've been doing to apply the technology that Ben um, and others.
others have been developing into um, an ultra rare syndrome, you know, that, that affects our community, but also um, spend some time at the end talking about um, how these, these technologies could or could not apply to, to patients with more common connective tissue disorders. So I'm just going to dive in. Um, my disclosures, uh, basically just research support from Angia Biotherapeutics, who is um, supporting this work um, in, in this rare condition. And let me um, describe it to you. This, this condition was actually described by Dr. Milowitz, who was um, back in 2010. And it's called um, multi-system smooth muscle dysfunction syndrome. It, it's caused by recurrent mutations in, in one position within the ACTA2 gene. And ACTA2 can cause um, familial aortic disease. But in, in this case, it's a really quite more severe condition that affects really any smooth muscle um, containing organ and, and really all the smooth muscle in the body. So in these children, um, we, we, they often turn up just after birth with abnormalities um, and unfortunately can have uh, strokes soon after they start uh, ambulation or, or walking. Um, if, if survived, they um, have progressive aortic disease often in the second decade of life and a shortened lifespan. And currently, there's no definitive medical or surgical therapy. Um, I see these patients in clinic with uh, Dr. Mussolino, who's a um, research partner and, and um, neurologist. So, you know, as described originally, really any organ with, with smooth muscle is affected. So the, the children have congenital myodrisis or really dilated pupils, uh, congenital heart disease, mostly ductus arteriosus and, and um, other forms of arterial disease. And then, as mentioned, aortic aneurysm and dissection that's progressive, low blood, blood pressure, uh, POTS, um, familiar to this community, and then other um, systemic symptoms like gut dysmotility, bowel dysmotility, and um, bladder um, atrophy. So this is a, um, you know, a disorder that, that is really on the severe end and, and, and quite ultra rare in our community. I think as, as Ben mentioned, if you're, if you're looking to uh, use a genetic therapy like CRISPR, and you want to hit the right tissues, at least in the vascular system, we need to find ways to access those tissues and to deliver these enzymes. And this has um, been really one of the central challenges of gene therapy, you know, for, for years on end, um, well prior to CRISPR, uh, the discovery of CRISPR. And in the... Um, brain, which is affected in, the, in these kids, we also need to get access to the small arterioles and the parasites that control um, neurovas the neurovasculature and the way blood flows to your brain um, on a minute to minute, even second to second basis. So um, Patty and, and Casey McGuire uh, at MGH had been working on developing what are called AVs or adenoviral associated viruses that can deliver uh, genetic cargoes to cells in people. And they stumbled across uh, by fortuitously a version that was um, derived from a common AV called AV9 that is actually already used clinically in patients. And um, this um, version of an AV with only a few um, modifications was actually able to hit the neurovasculature and in not only endothelial cells, but also smooth muscle cells within the neurovasculature. And it turned out that they were really looking at it um, from the brain side, but it turns out that it also hits systemic smooth muscle as well, um, including um, the proximal aorta uh, is shown in this figure. So in order to test these kind of therapeutics and to develop what we call preclinical data and, and data that 
we can use to um, move forward into patients, we have to actually test them in, in animal models of some sort to, for various reasons. One is effectiveness and another is um, safety. So we had developed a mouse model of this condition in which we can turn on uh, the specific mutation and, and model um, this arginine 179 that gets um, has a, a single nucleotide polymorphism that turns it into uh, a histidine. And as um, Ben had um, featured, these mice actually have nice recapitulation of the human condition. They have um, decreased survival and poor weight gain, probably mostly from intestinal dysmotility. Um, a lot like the human patients, they have decreased exercise tolerance and um, are relatively inactive because of that inability to exercise. And they also have, like many people um, with active T mutations, aortic uh, enlargement, both at the root and the ascending aorta. So we um, took the enzyme that uh, Ben had developed and made it into um, a split design because the AAVs, um, unfortunately, you can't package quite enough to get all the genetic information. So we actually have to split it in two and deliver it in two separate uh, viral particles. Um, and this is the schematic of that. Um, these are loaded into AV9 or AVPR, the, the special AV that I talked to you about. And in this experiment, we injected into the animals with the disorder at day three of life, and simulating an infantile uh, delivery. Um, you know, pretty remarkably, the treatment with either the AVPR or AV9 at day three of life was able to prolong uh, lifespan, as Ben just showed you, um, and we're still bringing out to longer term, but really by um, over twofold um, length of survival. And we see reversal of multiple uh, phenotypes in the animals, meaning the characteristics of the disease, including um, aortic uh, root and ascending aortic enlargement, which is um, controlled. And importantly for these, uh, for this disease, which, which suffers really um, bad neurovascular uh, control, able to revert the, the um, cerebral arteries to a um, more normal contractile phenotype uh, versus the mutant phenotype. They also showed um, better indices of exercise performance. This is this is what the quantification of the, that exercise looks like. But basically, in the mutant, uh, the animals aren't able to perform as well in these little tests that we give them. Uh, but the vector-treated uh, animals uh, are. Um, or this is called a rotor rod, where you, you actually put the mice on a little rod that spins, and they, they run around as long as they can and then fall off. Or in an open field test, which is literally where you just put them in an open field and and see how well they they um, wander around. This is a video um, of the of the actual animals. This is a wild type mouse and the sibling of this animal who is actually affected with the disorder. As you can see, they they um, they're relatively inactive and smaller than than their siblings who who don't have the condition. And then this is an animal who's been treated with the gene. Uh, editor and his wild type sibling that that is untreated and it's really difficult to tell the difference between the two so this is just a, a high level look at at the kind of, of work that it takes to um, you know to bring these things to one indication to an ultra rare indication but just to we, we've been able to create this model that looks a lot like um, the disorder in people. 
And then this particular AV base editor system delivered at a very early time point, and that is um, you know, day three of life, is able to prevent the, the vascular manifestations in the mouse model. And we saw improvements in exercise capacity, uh, weight gain, and activity levels. So that's, a, that's just a ton of work um, to get to this point in one um, mutation. And let me just give some credit to the people who did this work, um, Patty Mussolino and the, and the folks in her lab, BJ, and uh, Sabia and uh, Siobhan McCarthy, the folks in, in Ben's group that did a lot of engineering of the enzymes, Hannah Lanny and Chris Alves, and then David Chung, our neurovascular uh, specialist who's working with us, Casey McGuire, who helped develop the AV vector, uh, Christian Lino Cardenas, who's been a long time um, postdoc in my lab and now investigator on his own, and Ahmed Ra Rahman, who's uh, working on the GI or the, the gut phenotypes in the animals. So in the last part, I, I want to speak more to, you know, what about our um, community and, and specifically, you know, the connected tissue disorders that are cert, um, that the foundation serves. So Marfan syndrome, Lowe's Deed syndrome, beds, and other familial aortic uh, conditions. You know, what is this kind of work and this kind of technology um, mean? And I think it's a, um, an opportunity, but there, there's some, there's some limitations. Um, that you know we need to be clear-eyed and, and realistic about. So you know one of the things is just to take you through the the complexity of the genetics. This is this is the ACTA2 gene, the the gene that is um, you know has variant the variant that I just described to you, but it also has other gene changes. Really, in in almost every exon, we see you know, gene changes that cause disease in ACTA2, and typically this is adult onset thoracic aortic disease, really spread throughout uh, the gene. And this gene isn't really that big, you know, it's, um, the cDNA is about a thousand nucleotides. They, we, you know, there's been described about a hundred different gene changes um, in ACTA2, either pathogenic or likely, likely pathogenic. Well, what about um, you know, Lowy's Deed syndrome. Um, about twice the number of variants. It's it's still a little bit bigger gene. Lowy's Deed syndrome. Uh, the 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 variants tend to cluster in in the C terminus. This is um, by the way, this is only one of the genes. I just wanted to to feature TGFBR2 because it's a very common cause of Lowy's Deed syndrome. But you know, about two hundred variants. You can imagine having to engineer a new um, uh, enzyme for each of those and optimizing it. What that's not even starting. So what about VEDS? So this is call three A one. You know, currently it's it's a much bigger gene, many many exons. Uh, currently described, about nine hundred vari variants have been curated in ClinVar. And even more um, is the granddad of, of the conditions, which is Marfan syndrome. And this is the FBN1 gene. Right now in ClinVar, there's 3,500 uh, different variants spread throughout the gene, including um, intronic and, and exonic variants. So, you know, I think one of the things is that we have, while there are opportunities, um, this, the kind of work, illustrated here, you know, is going to be different for each condition. So what are the opportunities we have for autosomal dominant disease, which is typically typical of aortic uh, conditions? As Ben mentioned, and I'll take you through just the beginning of these, you know, we can try to reduce the expression of the disease gene allele. So this is sometimes called SNP targeting or targeting an allele-specific deletion by having the CRISPR recognize the disease allele and then delete that allele. This is different than the base editing that, that, I, that um, we showed you in the animal model. 
Now this may work for a condition like regular active two because those are dominant negative, but you know, it wouldn't probably be very helpful for Marfan syndrome because we know Marfan syndrome still operates in, in um, heterozygosity and, and um, so, you know, could work in one of the conditions, probably not the other, could maybe work in some of the LDS um, but like TGFBR2, but probably not for TGFB2 mutations. There's other uh, technologies like Ben talked about, like um, epigenetic regulators that are linked to, to CRISPR enzymes. So maybe we could, instead of deleting uh, the bad allele, we could you know, turn down the expression or the amount of RNA that's made from it. So we can you know, put a functional domain on it and maybe get some control of the transcription. And that may work for some applications and again, not others, um, but maybe a better option. Um, and then, you know, finally, there's there's a, a type of editing where we don't go after the disease gene itself, um, but after um, genes that control proteins that modulate that activity. So that's similar to the sickle cell, um, but not exactly the same, but but kind of similar to the sickle cell uh, story that that Ben showed earlier. In this case, we could think of it as somewhat like, you know, maybe there's a protease or a protein that that degrades um, the fibrillin one protein from Marfan syndrome, and so our goal would be to restore more fibrillin one to the tissues by targeting instead of fibrillin one a second target, and so maybe we find the gene that expresses uh, responsible for expressing the protease, and we take it out. Um, and that gets rid of the protease and maybe, you know, how you get some more fibrillin protein. You know, that could work for some of, um, some FBN1 variants, um, theoretically, uh, probably not in others. So, you know, I think just a short walk through it and, and I think a, you know, caution is that, you know, I think these tools will really um, dramatically change the way genetic uh, disorders are, are cared for, because I think there there are a lot of us seeking ways to get good, better targeting and better efficiency, and identifying better targets. Um, there won't be a single approach, though, in in genetically triggered arterial disorders. Just I can show you from the number of specific changes in some of these genes, we really we need to um, think of a more global strategy that the genomic engineering can, can help us with. So, you know, there are a lot of technologic challenges to be overcome, and I think there is a lot of room for optimism, but, but there, there are very real, real, uh, real challenges in terms of um, delivery, safety, and, um, and efficiency and effectiveness that we, we're going to have to, to uh, work out in the laboratory. Um, for each different condition. So uh, that's all I have today. So thank you very much. And um, pleasure to be here and happy to answer questions. That's great. Thank you, Mark. Um, that was fascinating. So my first question to you, when you're talking about all the different variants in FBN1, for example, um, would would it have to be you talked about looking for maybe a more of a global um therapy to help all of many of those uh, mutations within a gene but would things have to be more personalized depending on which mutation you have in that fibrillin one gene that is certainly one strategy and i think as shown in in the data that you know that we showed, you you could develop um, an editor for each individual variant, but that's fairly unlikely considering that you know not every gene change in in FBN one is personal, but many of them are and, and affect only one family or one described family. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think. 
it, it's probably more realistic to seek a therapy um, that can alleviate all of the, you know, that they can alleviate dysfunction of the of the fibrillin one gene in general, rather than right. um, a specific family's change. Right. Right. Thank you. So, can, I, can I just quickly add to that? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So I think the example of the sickle cell treatment that I showed that actually is not correcting the sickle cell mutation. It's right. adding another gene that regulates a related gene. So I think for diseases like Marfan, where if I'm understanding correctly, there's just a lot of different mutations depending on the individual. I think those are the types of approaches that you'd really want to think deeply about. If you can edit some other gene that compensates for the loss of function of, of the fibrillin gene, um, that's a lot more clinically tractable to, to be able to help as many patients as possible with one editing approach that could be translatable across all. Right, so that could be something that maybe is not targeting fibrillin one, but maybe something along that pathway to overcome some of the effects of that mutated gene. Right, yeah. up or downstream, um, understanding the biology of this pathway is the, the real key. I mean, this is how sickle cell has been treated and how a disease like spinal muscular atrophy has been treated. It's just this like really deep biological understanding of the gene. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, could like, I, could I add yeah, yes, I'd like to add my, uh, my other panelists to the, to the conversation. So Hal, yes, please. Um, so um, a few thoughts on that. So um, about a quarter of mutations that cause Marfan syndrome uh, while the changes are not identical, they have the same consequence. They prevent any protein production from the altered copy of the fibrillin 1 gene. Um, in that circumstance, for that large class of mutations causing Marfan syndrome, it should be possible to simply boost the production of fibrillin protein from the normal copy of the gene, the one that was not altered. Um, there are methods, as both Ben and Mark alluded to, to boost the expression of the gene. Um, and in, in that context, some, using something called CRISPR activation to do that, to turn up the pr production of protein from the unaltered copy um, should be therapeutic. Um, as uh, Ben was just alluding to, there has been really um, significant work by many groups to define the, the uh, downstream consequence of a deficiency of fibrillin 1. Um, our group and other groups that I know of um, have identified so-called modifier genes for Marfan syndrome um, in both people and in mice. Um, so uh, there should be the potential to, for example, boost the expression of a protective modifier gene that could compensate for the deficiency of fibrillin 1. Uh, you know, I, I want to congratulate Mark and Ben, really beautiful work, really exciting. Um, but I, I think the underlying theme um, is that a lot more research has to be done to try to understand what cell type needs to be corrected, what percent of cells need to be corrected, at what stage in development does that need to happen? Um, you know, for example, is it the performance of the average cell in the blood vessel that dictates whether disease occurs? Um, is it the performance of the majority of the cells in the blood vessel, or is it the performance of the weak link? Is uh, you know a small population of abnormal cells still sufficient to cause a tear of a blood vessel? We uh, uh, have good insight from um, from some studies, um, but a lot more work needs to be done. And you know, I, I think this kind of excitement should. Uh, lead to the proposal of specific research programs that will um, try to address these questions and, and illuminate the potential um, for this type of therapy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, uh, okay. So I, is uh, Diana Milowitz on too? Let me, is, yeah. Would you like to also comment here on, on this um, or on what you possibly think, you know, the, the timeline for something like this uh, is going to be? Uh, first, congratulations on the great work. This is really exciting. I want to note, uh, note that this summer at the Gordon Research Conference, we had some exciting data that if you blocked one specific protease in the, um, that's encoded by one gene, that you could really rescue the most severe uh, Marfan mouse from having dissection deaths. So I think we the data will be coming out on a specific protease that when you block it, you rescue Marfan syndrome. And it actually spent, explains some data that's in the literature that had everybody scratching their heads. So the look out for that. Um, great target to really boost those levels of fibrillin of the protein product in the tissues. And um, then uh, just getting back to the data that you presented, Mark, uh, you showed uh, nice data a few days after birth, but most patients aren't diagnosed that quickly. What happened when you did it later? I mean, does it depend on um, the aorta growing and the cells proliferating to actually uh, make these changes, or can you do it in an adult mouse? Yeah, it's a... Excellent question, of course. Um, you know, we, we've we've done it at a later time point that kind of simulates an adolescent rather than an infant um, in the mice. And while there is um, therapeutic effect, it's not as strong. And so I think we, you know, we have we haven't done adult animals, but obviously that's kind of the um, Mount Everest of a lot of this. Um, mm -hmm. is is accessing you know the adult aorta or the the adult vasculature um you know there there's a lot of tricks that we haven't tried though but but yeah that, that is um that will be an ongoing challenge because we want to be able to to develop these technologies you know for patients who may not get diagnosed until they're um you know a little older um and right. especially for um, Marfan syndrome, or you know that you know, obviously lots of folks don't get diagnosed till later. And one additional question: This is more for Ben. You know, we worry about off-target effects, and with the actins, there is like we have six actin genes, and they're all highly homologous. Have you gone back, and and are you worried about hitting those other actin genes? Because um, affecting the other actin genes. They don't have the mutation, so does that make them protected from the editing? Yeah, that's right. So I think we, we have done a pretty extensive safety study at the genetic level. Um, we're in the midst of validating off targets and different cell types, but you know, preliminary evidence says that this is quite safe. And you know, the sort of blessing and curse of these homologous genes is that the enzyme might bind there, but if there's no target base in those homologous genes, then we have nothing to edit, which is the case um, for this base editor we're using in this narrow edit window. So um, I think I would hate to say that we're not concerned about off targets because we always are worried about it, but you know, the, the early evidence suggests that this should be quite specific. Excellent. Very good. All right, Mark, can I ask you, um, did you have any effect on the eye phenotype in the mice? <laughs> We do. Um, we, we do get some recovery of the myodriasis and, and mm -hmm. are quantifying that now. Um, it's not complete. Um, and what is not... it? And how many cells do you actually correct? What percent of the cells? Do you have that data? Not in the eye, no. I mean, for the aorta. Or more importantly, the gut, because the fact they gain weight and grow means that you've corrected the gut phenotype. Yeah, the gut phenotype is is nicely reversed. Um, I think the percent editing in the gut is low. Um, I don't remember it then exactly, but it, it's um, something around 10% or something. 
Yeah, so I think we're limited by where the AAV can deliver the gene editors. And we see, you know, in some of these target tissues that we think are important for the phenotype in the low single digit or even double digit editing, but we're trying to learn what are the cells within the tissue that we're actually editing that's reversing the phenotype. Because, you know, a lot of the cells that are distal from the vessel may be unimportant for the disease, and we don't need to edit those. So even with a low fraction of editing, maybe we're editing just the important and part the cells that are like surrounding the vessel. So we're trying to figure that out right now. You know, you know, we wonder that, you know, is that low amount of editing, you know, just helping some of the other systems develop, like like the enteric nervous system and you know, you know, like those things that require smooth muscle function to to get mm -hmm. going. And then once they get going, then the marginal cells can can at least <laughs> react somewhat. And active two is not the major uh, actor in the smooth muscle cells in the gut. It's yes, the active yeah. gene three. It's the, the yeah. major. It just poisons all the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, Mark, when you did that experiment, it's a single injection that you gave these animals, just one injection, and with only a percentage of the cells being edited, you're still getting a, a, an extended life period for those animals. Yeah, different percentages for different organs, but yeah, that, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mark, in untreated mice, um, what was the cause, the major cause of death by 10 weeks of age? We actually, we actually think it's a t intestinal obstruction and megacolon mm -hmm. and probably sepsis or they basically, when you do a necropsy, um, their their colons are are basically just filled with um, stool, and and they just um, or their cecum, I should say, and they 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 can't um, they can't stool, and so we think they just they eat, and they fill up, um, and pass from that. So is there, um, in your mind, good evidence that um, this intervention did alter the natural history of vascular disease in this mouse model? Um, and can you describe a little more about that? Yeah, we, we have good evidence for um, both aortic uh, enlargement, but um, in that I didn't show in, the, in neurovascular um, coupling and, and responsiveness of the of the neurovascular system um, that that it, it goes back to proper neurovascular coupling uh, which is is a, is a huge problem in the kids because they um, don't respond properly to, to periods of hypotension or stress and and can't uh, perfuse watershed regions properly and um, stroke and um, you know we were able to to look at that in the mice, and, and it is re restored. Could you assess dissection risk? Uh, not not really in the mice. They don't. They have large aortas. Well, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit bigger than normal, but they don't dissect. Um, I think the experience of these mice is a lot like Dr. Milowitz's experience, where. Um, the smooth muscle vasculopathies, for whatever reason, just aren't as aggressive in mice when we model the same changes that are aggressive in people. So the early deaths in the mouse model at baseline are mostly GI, correct? The we same? think they're all GI. I've never found a dissection. So the idea of inactivating a copy of the gene, not, not in this case, here, but uh, well, it could work uh, for the active two as well, probably, if you could in specifically inactivate the altered copy. But it is a it is a target um, for vascular EDS, um, and it, because the the vascular the culture A1 null heterozygous null people have a much milder phenotype, and yes. so a generalized approach to working with people who have uh, 
missense variants or splicing variants that uh, are, you know, produce exon skipping or things of that sort uh, would be an approach that would be, you know, one of the kinds of things that you're talking about as a, as a generalized approach to it. And you'd ask whether that's true for other others of the dominant condition. Uh, Marfan syndrome, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a real way to go because the, the heterozygous nulls also seem to have significant phenotypes. Yeah. But if you could boost expression of the wild mm -hmm. allele in the heterozygous yeah. set. Have you, um, have you started work in the Marfan mouse models? I mean, I'm always working in Marfan mouse models. I don't have a, a base editor. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're still trying to select modifiers that, um, you know, mm -hmm. go after the right. And that low rate of correction, do you think it's because you've got the two AABs and you're just not getting both of them into a cell, or is your editing not working? Do you know? I, I can take a stab at that. I think Please. you know we have really high levels of editing in the liver, where we know that the AV transduction is really efficient. Mm -hmm. So it suggests that it probably is not a limitation of the dual AAV delivery. Mm -hmm. um, Although we'd love to move to a single AAV to avoid this issue of getting that issue together, yeah. um, the smaller editors, just in our experience, just haven't worked as well. So we have ongoing projects to try and make better enzymes that fit in a single AAV. But mm -hmm. for now, I think you know the the strategy works. Uh, understanding the kinetics of AAV transduction and finding the right capsids and eventually getting away from AV to nanoparticles where you can just transiently deliver the, the enzymes and the patients, that's a long-term goal. Yeah. So is there basically only two um, vectors that are currently being used, uh, two different types of vectors that you have to choose from depending on the, the system that you have? There are, no, I mean, there, there are lots of AVs um, mm -hmm. and, and, Many, um, well, not many, but you know, several already in clinical use. Um, but there aren't that many that hit smooth muscle, which was the goal. Um, and you know, in our experience, too. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Well, and one one more that we haven't tried, but um, it's kind of on the shelf. Right. And so you would have to look at that for each one of these conditions, depending on which cell type you're targeting. Yes, yeah, so although you know, hopefully you would find one or optimize one that that could hit um, mm -hmm. smooth muscle, or optimize like like Ben mentioned, a nanoparticle um, for smooth muscle delivery, so you could get away from all this um, AV. It's just that right now AVs are the most they're just good technology and they they work mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can't do the same kind of thing that the rna folks have been doing for um immunization and that sort of stuff and, and encapsulating the, the product in a non-viral vector of some sort right you, you can um but it but it's a, a technologic challenge to identify the packaging and, and um, how it gets delivered and to the right cell type. And you have the same issue of developmental uh, efficiency, mm -hmm. where the adults are going to behave differently than, than the infantile um, in, in those particles as well. It won't, that won't just be an AAV issue. The delivery is everything. Well, it's not everything. Ben has to create the the enzymes, but but after that, um, delivery is a huge, huge issue. Yeah, I think delivery remains the biggest issue. It, developing a gene editor is, I'd say, no longer the rate limiting step. It's mm -hmm. finding the right delivery vehicle to get to the tissue, and it's been that issue for the last forty years. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in terms of um, uh, the probability to have a mature technology in the coming years, do you think it's 10, 20, 30 years? 
and anybody? So I would say that five years ago, I couldn't even come close to predicting <laughs> what we could do now. So on that basis, I would say we can't even come close to predicting what we will be able to do five years from now. But, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I wouldn't be pessimistic that it would be 10 or 20 years. I would hope it would be sooner, but I, I don't know. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would hope it would be sooner than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 I I mean I don't know that you have the answer to these questions, um, but you know, um, would it would would any of these treatments have to be used at a fetal stage more or at an adolescent stage, and what would happen to it seems like the mouse model sort of remodeled and and you know developed more normally at that stage uh, using your mice. Um, I don't know if that could happen in a human. Um, what age was that mouse when you when you treated it? Three days. Three days. That's equivalent Three to days. a couple month old human baby. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I just checked, and both our severe vascular EDS mouse model and our um, missense Marfan mouse model would be corrected by a A to G base editor. So I'm stating here that I'll donate those to your research. Uh, um, it would be a great experiment to do. Um, so thank you. Got a lot of love for that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, let me see some of these other questions that have come in. Um, so for autosomal dominant disorders, has there been any exploration of dosage compensation using the non-affected copy of the gene for heterozygous individuals? Remodulation of the downstream pathway participants or copy number alterations. And Hal can speak to that. The, the original mouse model, um, after it was created, was shown to be suppressed by um, overexpression of a wild type, um, Berlin 1, for instance. Um, sorry, I'm speaking for him. Well, yeah. so I mean, there has been some, and I, I think each, but each gene is is um, different. So, um, in the as Mark correctly stated, um, in the Marfan mouse model, we added another copy of a normal fibrillin one gene on top of the one abnormal copy and one normal copy, and that um, greatly extended. Um, the lifespan of the mouse. So um, dosage compensation, I think, has um, has merit and some evidence. So there's a question here about um, her understanding is that gene editing for null versus other mutations of VEDS may look different and require a different technology called PRIME. Does anybody have um, any information on that? I mean, um, I don't want to get out of my box, but... <laughs> Prime editing is a different type of editing that can do a little more, a um, little longer stretches. But a lot of the null mutations in, in VEDS are also single nucleotide premature truncation codons um, or premature, that form a premature truncation codon. Um, not all of them, but some of them are. So it really depends more on the mutation that causes the class effect mm -hmm. null versus um, splice site or 
deletion or um, than than that particular subsetting of mutation. I don't know if that makes there's sense. A whole, Maybe Peter yeah, can there's a whole that. range of, of mutations. They, they can include nucleotide insertions or, de or deletions that are not a multiple of three. Uh, splice mutations, uh, the, perhaps the most effective one in doing that is a minus one G to A in a, a splice acceptor site, which moves the splice site one nucleotide downstream. But that's a, another, um, uh, um, that's a G to an A at that site. I don't know whether that fits in your base or the base editor that you have. And that's similar to what Hal was talking about. Um, uh, and there, the uh, intent is to restore the activity of the normal of, of the, you know, the altered copy. Um, obviously, with bigger deletions that are uh, non-duplicates of three or things of that sort, it, it's more. I suspect it's more difficult to actually repair those. Um, and it, you know, they're not the prime target for uh, people with vascular EDS. The prime targets would be the people who have the the more severe, the more severe end of the spectrum, and in a sense, by converting theirs to a, a null uh, potentially, so that you modify the effect by um, getting rid of the uh, 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 protein and do it at the RNA level so that you don't have the problems with uh, storing abnormal molecules and protein. We have a couple of questions here about. AI and wondering whether you think that AI can be used to help you accelerate some of these development of some of these therapies. I can maybe just say briefly, you know, for gene editing technology development, AI is playing a big role in how we build tools that allow us to treat you know, the vast diversity of mutations, because we have to design enzymes to safely recognize individual spots in the genome. So being able to understand the diversity of tools that exist in nature and, and understanding how to reprogram them to different parts of the genome, um, large scale data sets combined with machine learning really is enabling that to happen. I would say I of any kind might be helpful. The conventional intelligence is <laughs> yeah I'd say we you know we we've used that type of technology to um, for gene discovery in aortic disease not specifically Marfan syndrome and that type those types of observations have been you know fortuitous in identifying targets for for genomic engineering um, you know we we haven't figure that out for aortic disease yet, but I mean, that's how, um, well, that type of genetic association experiment is how the target was identified for sickle cell, for instance. So, you know, I think AI can be useful. It's not um, a panacea, but it, it's definitely helps um, take on large tasks that otherwise would take too much manpower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, another question here that's interesting. Assuming that the technology is deliverable in five to 10 years, would it be safe to say that alongside this technology, it would be extremely important to promote the early identification of the gene um, mutations by promoting testing for VEDS uh, and, and LDS um, quicker? And, uh, you know, I know that 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 is is definitely one of the um, uh, things that are considered for um, early screening of genetic conditions, especially if there is a technology out there. So does anybody else want to comment on that? I mean, I suspect that within a relatively short period of time, everyone will be sequenced at birth and um, actionable genetic alterations will then have the potential to be um, addressed um, early on in life. So um, I don't think we're that far off from that. Yeah, 
-hmm. In the meantime, we've used AI for facial recognition of some of these syndromes. And Peter, you always taught me there was a clear facial feature for beds. And based on AI, it completely agrees with you. And interestingly enough, it picks, it picks up not only the severe mutations, but the very mild mutations that I can't even see the facial structure there, but the AI program can pick that up. So we're trying it with Marfan's and, and Lois D mm -hmm. syndrome, but BEDS has really jumped out as being a very distinct facial appearance that you always classified Peter as very attractive, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, that's my bottom line for everything. <laughs> right. I think, you know, is there, um, you know, is Stu Orkinen talking about the treatment of uh, sickle cell uh, suggested that the, the genetic approach or the, you know, the, um, the interfering with the, the, um, the gene that was, you know, that's now being worked on is a very expensive one and, uh, and very difficult to implement over a wide scale population. Uh, but that small molecule approaches to trying the same kind of thing would be maybe much better and, or not necessarily better, but equally effective at a much, much lower uh, cost uh, level. And perhaps um, you know, it would be possible to augment the production of, of the wild type gene in the, in the context where um, you could uh, make an effect in people where it, where you could mimic the, the the experiment that Hal did by, you know, inserting a second copy of the gene, but in this case, um, boost the production of the normal one with a variety of um, uh, small molecules, and that probably looking at, you know, it it's become easier now, either with uh, long read sequencing to identify specific alleles along the genes and. Uh, to look there at uh, the relative production of those genes and ask whether or not there are targets that, that would work for specific ones of those. And I think something like that is another way of, of um, doing this and, and approaching uh, the treatment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One last question, uh, I have to the group. Um, and maybe Mark, you can talk to um, about your mouse model here. Were there any side effects from unwanted side effects from this treatment? Um, and can you can you think about like what possible side side effects there may be if you were to deliver this to a human? Um, we didn't detect any side effects. Um, but it, mice aren't the ideal, um, you know, animal <laughs> system for detecting longer term side effects. So, um, you really need to model those kind of things, um, in larger animals or, um, you know, to, to look for toxicity or, or off target effects. You, mm -hmm. you generally have to shift out of, out of mice. They're just, they're too short lived. And um, their metabolism is too fast. So. I see. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, I want to thank you all for such an informative um, webinar. I think our um, we're getting a lot of hearts here and telling us telling you that you're all brilliant people and how much they love you. <laughs> so I want to thank you really very much for. Uh, your dedication to Marfan and all of these connective tissues and to really looking at these progressive technologies and giving our uh, population hope that we can really look at this as something in our future. And I think that's a, a very good thing. It may take some time, um, but I really want to give people hope that the, the science and the research is moving forward and that there are people that are looking at this for um, our connective tissue disorders. So I really do appreciate that. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for putting it on, guys. Have a great night. Ben and Mark, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks so much. Bye. Great to see you guys. Bye.